And which Kristen did you decide was going to uh, start things off? That would be me, Chair Kunstman. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to the City of Boulder Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Board meeting for Monday, June 5th, 2023. The time is 3.05 p.m. I will begin by displaying and reading the instructions for virtual meetings and rules of decorum. Public participation at Beverage Licensing Authority and Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Meetings. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More information about this vision and the project's community engagement process can be found at the link on your screen. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support the, this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. All right, ready for roll call? That I am. Member Anderson. Still no, no response yet. Member Christie did email his absence. Member Daniel. Present. Member Green. I'm not seeing. Oh. Hmm. So she was going to join us. Um, I got a text from her. Uh, she, her son is in a state championship little league game and she, she's driving back and forth. She was going to join us virtually or, or just um, not with uh, the camera, but I guess uh, she didn't quite make it yet. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Keegan. Present. Chair Kunzman. Present. Member Noble. Present. Ex officio member Thompson did email her absence. So ex officio member Bailey. Present. We have a quorum. Um, I will, oh. I'm just, I'm wondering if, um, Sandra, do you want to uh, introduce our um extra extra attorney <laughs> or, or, or attorney uh yeah I'm happy, today. To, I'm happy to do that yes so so thank you chair um I am thrilled and excited to introduce to you Andy Prohart who recently joined the city attorney's office uh, I believe it was May 15th and um he comes from the AG's office he can describe to you a little bit about his background um, when I hand it over to him, but um, we've been doing some training, he and I, uh, related to CLAB. He's also going, has other responsibilities. He's going to be uh, representing the IT department. And um, now, I'm, now I'm forgetting. <laughs> um, purchasing and, and contracts and things like that, which he responds to. And he has a lot of great experience experience with boards uh, and supporting boards and commissions. So we're super excited to have him here. Um, you already saw uh, a little bit of his work in the packet. Uh, uh, there was a memo in there that he did uh, relating to um, the use of the term marijuana. Um, really great work, Andy, thank you so much. And um, I'm excited to uh, hand the reins off to you while I have enjoyed my time well, supporting this board, I am anxious to get back to my main duties and um, 
I know and, and believe that Andy will do a fantastic job and I will continue to support him as I am his supervisor. So uh, we're gonna continue to work together to, to make sure that you all here on this board um, get all the support that you need. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Andy. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hi board. Uh, obviously, Andy Frohart, I come from the Colorado Attorney General's office. Um, I've represented three boards. So they were mostly, uh, there was the first one was the Autonomous Mobility Task Force, which was part of CDOT. Um, and then I represented two broadband boards. And one of them um, was engaged in I guess, fairly contentious um, decision-making that included quasi-judicial decision-making. And so I'm uh, excited to come in and help with the creation of this process and to support you all. Um, stylistically, I'm pretty hands-on. So I'll probably, uh, I guess, don't be afraid to direct me and staff to, to collaborate and work on things to produce first drafts and sort of get things into shape before they, they come your way. Um, and I would really love to get to know all of you. So at some point, um, if you have time, I'd love to have coffee or have a conference call just so I can get some of your perspectives and learn how I can support your efforts. And if there's things that can be improved or tweaked or just generally to get an idea of, of what your thoughts are um, so be looking out for that contact shortly from me. And um, the last thing I'll say is, I think it's it's really great. I, I know you all spend a lot of time. I haven't had a ton of uh, a chance to talk to you about how much time you spend really, but but that's really one of the great things of government is when people come in and spend a lot of time committing to something sort of selflessly uh, without any any benefits to them personally. And so kudos to you. Um, and if I can make that easier on you, uh, please let me know. So good meeting you all. Thanks, Andy. And in terms of the transition, uh, this will be my last meeting with Cloud, and Andy will take over next month. Does Hit the ground you? running. Uh, thanks. And, and you're okay with us calling you Andy? Yes. Uh, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, all of us are fine with us being called by our first name, but I was waiting to see what one of the Christians call you to see if they would call you Councillor Frohart or something like that. Oh, yeah. um, no, please call me Andy. I thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, I appreciate the thing you put together also. Um, so um, I think now I got to scroll right. back up. So continuing on with our agenda is the approval of the cannabis licensing and advisory board meeting minutes from May 1st, 2023. Does anyone have any concerns about uh, past minutes? Corrections? Brian, motions to approve the May minutes. And a second on that? Anyone? Ethan, I know you're just dying oh, to do yeah. a second on that. Okay. Um, anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, good. Um, and next is, well, no, excuse me, elections of chair and vice chair. Certainly. So elections of chair and vice chair is the next item on our agenda. For this process, we will typically hear nominations for the chair and then proceed through that process and then move on for vice chair. the point of consideration i know that we're missing two members do we want to continue forward with the election or nomination process or do we want to table this for another meeting when we have a fuller attendance brian's got a good point that was the reason why we delayed that until this meeting i think we have even less than the last time we chose to delay and then just uh tell me to get ahead of ourselves here, but just um, scheduling for July, well, it's likely that we may not have a July meeting. We can, of course, discuss this later on uh, in the meeting, but that um, our next opportunity to have election or to have a meeting after this one may not be until um, August as well. What do folks think? Robin? I guess I would check in with you, Chair, to see how you're feeling if you're you know, willing, obviously, 
you're going to do this meeting, but um, are you okay waiting? Are you hoping to have more certainty about what your role is going to be going forward? I, I'm not in any hurry. I fully support waiting till we have the bigger board present, but did want to check in with you on how you're feeling. Well, I think as I have said before, although I don't know if I said it publicly in this forum, but I might have just mentioned it to Brian um, that I'm fine with continuing as the chair, even if it is for a month or two. Um, I was, you know, if, if we were going to have elections, I was going to see who else wants to be chair. And, and you know, I don't want to um, hoard the position uh, if, if someone else really wants to be chair. I'm fine with that, uh, but I'm also fine continuing on. I mean, I, I enjoy being the chair, I don't, but it's not my life's work, I guess. Uh, just speaking from only for myself, I think my I share uh, Member Noble's sentiment that I would like to have as full membership possible here for this decision, but I'm also comfortable with Tom remaining chair until we have time to have an election with everyone present. We want to hear from Ethan and Allison too. Yeah, for the same reason that we postponed elections um, last meeting, I think it's appropriate to, to push these out again out of respect for those who are not present. Sounds like a plan. I, do we need to vote on that? Okay, you're you're muted. All right, and no, I don't think there's any need for that. Just okay. Just All we'll right. just make note of it. That we'll, we'll just push it off to the next agenda. Yeah, move that to the next meeting. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so next, I have general public comments for the board. One one right. moment. I would like to make an agenda notation, Chair Kunzman. Okay. Yeah. Agenda item number five in the packet agenda. Um, is was decided to be heard before agenda item four due to timing for those following along in the meeting packet. Okay. Sounds okay. great. And I see and, Elizabeth is already here. Correct. So um, continuing on in the agenda is agenda item number two, general public comments for the board. So public comments, we, I'm sorry. I see 21 participants, but I only see 15 on my screen and I don't see a, do we have everybody in the room? So the way that this new Zoom format works is that um, there, oh, are don't people, see them. there are people who are panelists, um, which I include city staff and board members only, okay. and then presenters if we have them. Um, and then everyone else is under attendees. Um, I, as the Zoom host, can see the attendees, but no one else can. So I will be able to um, make sure that whoever needs to speak for public comment can speak, but that's why you're not seeing that. Uh, so just two more names that I'm not familiar with, and or maybe I just don't remember, and I am familiar with, Christopher and Jolly. Yeah, is it Yalia, Jalia? I'm not sure how, how to pronounce that one. Christopher says City of Boulder. Uh, uh, yes, uh, hello, Chair. I am a new licensing specialist with the licensing division for the City of Boulder. This is my okay. first time attending the meeting, so I'm just here to learn. All right, welcome, Christopher. And good afternoon, board members, Elizabeth Crow with Housing and Human Services. Um, my colleague, Jalia Daly, and I will be presenting on the C-Fund update shortly. Uh, I might have guessed that, but thank you for clarifying that. It's better not to make any assumptions, right? Okay, uh, so in that case, we're ready for general public comments, right? That is correct. <laughs> All right. Again, public comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker. If you wish to speak, you can use, raise your hand using the um, icon at the bottom of your screen. If anyone is calling in by phone, they can raise their hand by pressing star nine. Do we have anyone for general public comment? I'm not seeing any raised hands in the uh, attendees. While we're waiting, I'll just mention that Evan did text back and says he's not going to be able to make the meeting today.
and still no raised hands for me. Chair Kunzman, would you like me to close the general public comment section? I think uh, that seems appropriate. Okay. So we're still gonna do three and then five. Correct. Okay. So Pam, you wanna? Member, uh, <clears throat> apologies. We're in this new process of calling agenda items. Agenda item number three matters from the Cannabis Enforcement Officer. Officer Gignac? Yeah, I don't have anything uh, for the panel, but I was wondering if anybody has any questions uh, for me that you guys have been waiting to ask. Officer Gignac, are you sort of attending every couple of meetings or what's how are you doing things so that if I do have a question or need a minute to think about things before? I'm attending um, every meeting. I think I've missed two and that was for personal reasons. Okay. Um, now I don't stay on the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> You guys, you guys go a little late. <laughs> well, and I saw you on the agenda. I just wasn't exactly sure that what you might have for us. So that's good good to remember to bring things if we've got them. Yeah, I think that that's new so that if I do have anything I need to present or ask you guys, I, there's a place for me to do that. So that's the new addition to the format. I guess I, 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 guess I do have one quick question, if you don't mind, Chair. No, yeah, I, I actually was thinking I, I, I'll let you ask and then I, I'll, I'll work on my question. So the um, MA, the Marijuana Enforcement Division has this new, or they're, they're getting ready to roll out this new dashboard where you can see underage violations and that sort of thing. How do you and the Boulder Police Department feed into that, if at all? And, and if not, do you do your own? Are you, is your sting stuff back up and running? And how do you report it? Um, we report our stings uh, via just a report. We document the day we did it and what facilities we visited and what the results were, pass or fail. Uh, we, um, usually the first one of the year we do with the state. Um, so, um, they don't, I don't have to report it to them because they were there. So they know what the results were. Um, any others that I do or that they do, uh, most of the time we ask each other to, to attend. So usually there's, we're both doing the same ones. Um, I do some additional ones, some spot checks that the state doesn't do. Um, but I keep a running log sheet of those um and right now we're not tied into their dashboard um but they're still um we're gonna talk about that a few of them are out on vacation so when they come back we're gonna see if there's a way for us to add our information to the state um but right now we don't participate in their dashboard okay and just a quick follow-up the log that you keep is that something you could share with clab yeah, anytime you guys want to know how many inspections I've done and and what the results are, I'd be glad to tell you. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see it in the packet, just an update from you with that info. Yeah. Thank you. You are welcome. So Pam, I have a few questions. Um, in, in two different arenas. Uh, and 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 maybe this is more like protocol. Um, Kristen's and or Sandra or Andy, when we get to the policy suggestion form, um, I'm trying to figure out the legalities of the consultation room. Um, and I mean, we can wait until we get to there in the agenda or is this the only time that Pam gets to talk? And Pam, do you mind me calling you Pam or do you wanna be officer? Either, either one's fine. 
Okay, that's why I asked Andy, and that's why I asked you too. <laughs> and um, so, what would be most appropriate um, from the group's point of view? Well, on that one, I'll have to defer to the city attorney on uh -huh. if there's any legalities of what can and cannot be discussed. Good so choice. I think that um, as long as you're okay, Pam, with hanging on, I'd like to just get through the agenda because it is one of the items and um, uh, that's on our agenda to discuss. And actually, is it the next one? No, it, I guess it's after the uh, update. Um, Alyssa, are you okay with hanging on for that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, let's do that then. Thanks. Okay, that's what I figured would be the most appropriate. Um, I just want to make sure that we can call on her if we need to call on her. Um, and the other questions have to do, which I don't think is technically on our agenda for today, but um, most people probably know there was an article in the newspaper yesterday um, about our some of our work or some of our discussions that um, the essence of the article was to say that the hospitality business will be brought to city council at some point in time. And there's a pretty good discussion, a fairly balanced discussion, I would say, um, by the author. And uh, one of the things it talked about in the article that it just made me wonder, you know, when we put together the recommendations that those under the age of 25 would not be allowed to in hospitality suites, I wonder about the enforceability of that. And, and as you might have, as you said just a moment ago, that might be, you might yield or, or allow the city attorneys to answer that rather than you, but I'm also wondering from the police point of view. Well, depending, you know, if it's approved and how the statute is written, uh, we have full enforcement rights. So if it's written that it has to be 25 and older, that's that's what we will enforce. So it's the same as if, you know, those under the age of 21 try to get into an alcohol establishment. Yes, sir. Right, okay. Um, and just in case everyone wasn't aware, there was, a, was the article yesterday, which Brian, thank you, Brian, for forwarding that to me. Um, congratulations on Robin, on Robin and Stacy, who might be joining us on getting quoted. Um, but um, anyways, all right. So I think we're ready for the policy suggestion. Oh, wait, no, we we're going to do five. Okay, you want to mm -hmm. introduce five? Certainly. Our next item on the agenda is set as agenda number five in the packet. Um, but we are moving it up. That is the update on the Substance Education Awareness Fund. We have Elizabeth Crow with us. Hi, good afternoon, board members. I'm Elizabeth Crow again, uh, Deputy Director for the City's Housing and Human Services Department. It's actually been a couple of years, almost to the month, um, since I was last here uh, providing you an update on our Substance Education Awareness Fund, or C Fund program. And I'm very excited to be able to introduce to you my colleague, um, Jalia Daly, um, who can come on camera now. Um, so we've had a lot of changes um, in the program and also within our staffing uh, support for this program in the last couple of years. Um, one is that I transitioned um, about a year ago to a new role in the department, and that left uh, my vacancy as investments manager, um, which Jalea is now filling and has been since the end of October. Um, getting up to speed on all of the intricacies and nuances of the C Fund um, and is going to be uh, providing the, the bulk of the presentation for you all today. Um, we've got a slideshow that I will um, forward, and I think I have the permissions to do that. We'll find out in just a moment, and Kristen or Kristen cor will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but before I turn it over to Julia, I um, just want to thank you um, for, this, for your service um, on this board. Know that these are topics um, very important to you, and it's part of our role in the Housing and Human Services Department, along with our colleagues and tax and finance in the city attorney's office to make sure that 
the revenue um, from the recreational marijuana um, tax resource is really put to very good use and very strategic use um, for youth prevention of substance use and abuse. So with that, um, we'll introduce Julia and um, I'll go ahead and get the slides up. Julia, if you wanna start just by introducing yourself and then we'll move ahead. Hello everyone, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, my name is Jalea Daly. Um, still fairly new to my role as the Human, human Services Investments Manager uh, in the Housing and Human Services Department, which I am thoroughly enjoying thus far. Uh, still learning a lot, but also feeling pretty confident in certain things. And so I am very thankful to have uh, Elizabeth here for her support during this um, presentation. Um, and so if I seem like I am just having a cliffhanger, um, she will likely jump in to help out. <laughs> Julia, I will interject really quickly and say I actually am not able to screen share. Um, Kristen, if you can um, help out with that, that would be great. It says it's been disabled. Or Caitlin. I can help you. Okay, great. Thank One you. Second. One second. Yeah. Yes, Caitlin is our back-end administrator for our meetings, um, of which we are very grateful. Thank you. I should not be confused by three staff members whose names begin with K, but <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> and, and Caitlin, All right, there we go. Cool. Caitlin, before you start real quickly, Caitlin, you're watching the waiting room. Should Stacy join us, right? I absolutely am, yes. Okay. So um, again, this presentation is put together just for uh, the members of the Cannabis uh, Licensing Advisory Board. Um, and we will get going. So um, to provide a little bit of background, some of you may have been on the board uh, the last time that Elizabeth presented. Some of you may not have been. I know I wasn't. So. Um, the Substance Education and Awareness Fund um, is a part of the revised code 314-1 legislative intent for public safety enforcement and administrative purposes and for comprehensive substance abuse programs, including and without limitation prevention, treatment, education, responsible use, intervention, and monitoring with an emphasis on youth. And so that is the primary focus of uh, the funds that are collected through the marijuana tax revenue and the vape tax revenue. Um, and so back in 2013 is when it was approved by voters. And then in 2016 is when the actual fund came on board and started funding programs within the community to provide substance education and awareness to youth and to um, their parents and other trusted adults. And then the first round of funds that were actually allocated started in 2017. As of 2021, there's been the addition of the um, vape tax. And so it originally started out as just the marijuana tax revenue. And um, it's been a great addition, um, promoting prevention in the community for vaping. And then, um, just in 2022, there was a second round of C fund um, awards or grants. Uh, it is a five year cycle. Uh, the way that the funding runs is five every five years. And so we are in year two of our second five year round. Um, so the way that we actually have the C fund structured currently is that the city is the financial sort of manager of the uh, an ad, uh, um, what should I say the financial manager um, that was I wanted to use a better word than that but couldn't think of one um, uh, as we monitor and receive the funds. Um, and then we partner with Boulder County Community Services to provide technical assistance and training to our community partners. And so um, on the city side, we hold the fund round, we get contracts out into the community and we review end of year reports and the, our community partner, our partners with Boulder Community Services provide consultation, technical assistance, 
Um, they facilitate our quarterly meeting and um, they do program uh, data tracking as well um, to assist us with like annual reports and things of that nature. So um, the major focus and goal of the C fund is to do four things, uh, create widespread community distribution uh, and awareness of the information and programs that are available within the city of Boulder. Second, to shift community perceptions of the risk associated with substance use, including you know, the impact of drugs, alcohol, recreational marijuana, and the use of prescription drugs uh, among children and youth. Thirdly, is to prevent and reduce youth use of alcohol and rec recreational drugs, including marijuana. And last but not least is to reduce accidental ingestion of marijuana and other drugs. This is the first segment of the C fund logic model. And we all love a good logic model that helps us to, you know, think about how are we making an impact in the community? How are we measuring any, how are we measuring that impact? And so um, one of the things that we do is partner programming and we have strategic activities that are going on in the community to enhance the work that we're doing. And that is providing, you know, technical assistance and substance use prevention training for staff that implement the C-Fund programs. And so on the youth level, um, there's alternative recreational activities that are put on by groups um, that are considered to be natural highs. And so those are activities that kids can go out in the community and do and engage in instead of engaging in uh, negative behaviors or behaviors that lead to substance use and abuse. Um, there are peer mentorship um, between youth in other programs and also when we think of YOAB, which we'll get to a little bit lower, further down in the presentation, but the youth opportunities and advisory board. And then there's uh, youth adult leadership activities where uh, trusted adults uh, engage in um, activities and leadership with youth. Next is for the caregivers and our program facilitators engage with parents um, to help them learn about the most uh, current data and best practices um, to help you know train them and increase their familial uh, knowledge of how to engage with their youth and communicate with their youth about substance use and abuse. Um, and uh, lastly are for other adults that may not be parents or program staff that are trusted adults that engage in any activities um, or just engage with youth. And those again are to provide training uh, to those adults on how to be positive role models with our youth and other adult youth leadership activities um, and then promoting uh, responsible retailer practices. Um, this is one of our community partners um, that promote and reduce access, promote youth, per, excuse me, promote the reduction of youth access to substance uses, to, to substances. And then lastly is uh, community education on substance use issues. And my apologies that I am so tongue-tied. Mm -hmm. Next is the outcomes or what we, um, you know, look for the funds to be doing in terms of impacting in the community. And so partner outcomes include increased implementation and, uh, of substance use prevention strategies, expansion of substance use prevention through uh, collaboration work, and then implementation and sustainability of equitable practice within uh, each agency's culture. And so what that really means is, you know, encouraging the community partners that receive grantee funding from the C fund to collaborate with each other so that they're not necessarily duplicating services and to, um, you know, implement a sustainable model that, 
that promotes a culture of equity um, within each one of their agencies and also to reflect hopefully that the staff that are providing the services reflect the youth that are uh, utilizing utilizing the services. And then actual program outcomes that we intend and hope to see is that parents and trusted adults are setting clear expectation for youth um, regarding alcohol and marijuana consumption. Parents and trusted adults will also have an influence uh, on youth decisions um, to vape and use alcohol and other um, substances. Uh, adults and youth will perceive the risk associated with substance use um, and vaping. And lastly, that youth will feel that they have a trusted adult that they can go to if they have any issues, especially where peer pressure and things like that are concerned. Lastly are the actual goals of the Substance Use Education and Awareness Fund. And we break it down into short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals. And these are goals that are worked through in periodic times. And so for short-term, you know, we intend to have widespread community distribution uh, and awareness of the information. And so helping uh, to do that is being a part of this meeting today um, and making sure that we have um, a good uh, platform online as well for folks to access um, any resources that they might need. Uh, intermediate would be to shift community perceptions of risk associated with substance use and abuse. Um, Long-term are prevention of youth substance use and, and abuse. And uh, the fourth goal would be to prevent and reduce actual ingestion of marijuana and other drugs. And that's for not only youth and kids, but also your animals and stuff too, you know? Um, so that's a pretty important one. And um, within this uh, entire framework of prevention activities, you know, they will reduce and or eliminate health disparities that are associated with substance use and abuse. So some major uh, elements of the C fund um, include utilizing multiple resources and grantee supports for increased capacity and long-term impact. And so through that, we have five-year grant cycles, as I mentioned previously. Um, this uh, past year in 2022, we offered off-cycle investments um, to community partners. Um, we uh, create learning every learning environment and uh, environment of collaboration among uh, C fund partners, and then provide training and technical assistance um, for community partners that uh, receive C fund uh, funding. These are all of our partners. We have the names listed on the left side, and then. Um, or grantees, I should say, and then their actual logos. Um, some of them you may recognize from just uh, working in the community and in the capacity that you do, and some of them you may not. And the text is not that big. And so just thought it might be helpful to have that there on the left. Um, uh, some fun highlights that we thought we would like to share with you is that for the 2022 grant term, which spans um, January 1st to December 31st, um, about 2,200 youth were served uh, across all of our grantees. And um, Pillar, which is the prevention and intervention for lifelong alternative recovery, um, which is through Boulder <laughs> County Health or Community Health, excuse me. Um, they partner with Boulder County Public Health to, distrib to distribute over 60 Narcan kits and do overdose reversal trainings um, at the Pride Fest last year. Um, Boulder County Public Health, um, they uh, are funded through our vape funding and they actually hosted a media campaign 
um, to help reduce uh, youth use of vape vaping products, whether they be uh, just tobacco or marijuana containing. And they reached over 3,100 unique, I mean, excuse me, 31,000 unique users with um, over 1.8 million impressions. Um, and that's quite impressive, I think. Um, I'm not a huge tech person or anything like that, mm -hmm. but that's saying that, you know, they're reaching a lot of families within the Boulder community and people are going on their website and looking at the materials that they have available. Um, and that's mainly uh, youth that are ages 18 to 21, which is a major part of, um, you know, our caption, uh, uh, caption area or the group of folks that we want to impact in the community. 90% of youth reported feeling support from the staff at the YMCA of Northern Colorado when they attended uh, programs in the community. And they do, that, that includes like going bowling and different things like that, that allows them to kind of engage with peers and with trusted adults and um, staff of the YMCA program. And that 76% also felt participation increased their self-confidence. And lastly, over 180 kits for quit, 180 quit kits were provided to youth who smoke or vape to help them quit. And that was a cool program uh, that was started by youth that attend natural highs. And it was their thought to do that. And it includes chewing gum and other things that kind of take on some sensory, you know, things that may cause somebody to want to smoke. And um, one fun thing that I have that I could add is that one of our new off-cycle grantees, which, of which there are four for the 2023 grant cycle, um, does also offer fentanyl uh, test kits in addition to Narcan um, emergency re reversal um, medication as well for those that may um, ingest and, and overdose. The um, Institute for Strengthening Families is um, a new initiative um, that was um, brought forth uh, in 2022 that um, is a bilingual website for parents and youth alike to go on and find community resources and different things that are going on in the community. Um, to help promote their communication with one another around substance use um, and, you know, helps them to feel confident with communicating with each other, whether it's parent to youth or youth to parent. And we do um, anticipate that number rising um, to include a lot more folks once uh, the site goes live. So the, the site has kind of been in a pilot period right now. And once the school year jumps off in fall, it will become public. And so there should be far more um, attention and traffic to that website. And um, Pathways to Prevention is uh, a program that is supported by our partners at Boulder County Community Services. Um, that provides subsidized training and certification for peer specialists in the community and also for family um, specialists in the community to get certified on substance use education with best practices and uh, best interventions to uh, engage with youth. And um, the great thing about that is that there's, you know, the creation of potential jobs with getting that certification for folks. And so that's a really great way to get folks um, get getting paid for doing some of the things that they're passionate about um, and also promoting, you know, substance education and awareness in the community. And then um, Lastly is our Youth Opportunities Advisory Board, and they serve as a, an advisory committee to the Substance Education and Awareness Fund, and in the past had um, the capacity to vote on what things got funded that were, folks submitted applications for, um, and they did have input on our um, off-cycle funding opportunities this past um, funding off-round off -round funding cycle that we had. 
um, and um, they engage in evaluation. And I know that they're really looking forward to getting the annual uh, report that we are going to be uh, publishing here later on in the summer or early fall um, to see what is the actual impact of the C fund dollars in the community live action and in living color. So we're excited to get that published here in the coming uh, weeks or months. And thank you so much for your time. And I am sorry I was babbling. I've had a really bad headache today. But anyway, for more information, please contact myself um or elizabeth crow my supervisor and the deputy director um and we also provided our web page there available for you um were there any questions or anything at this moment i know i just kind of spat a lot of information at you Questions? I'll speak up, Jalia. Thank you so much for your presentation. Is there, where can we see the Boulder County Public Health Media campaign that had all those impressions? Oh, the, um, for the uh, Strengthening Families, um, I believe it should be on our website, but we're happy to provide the link for you directly. I guess I was just going back to the thing that said that you guys had had like 1.3 million impressions on a media campaign. That one, that's the uh, third bullet point oh, there. The Boulder, that, that's, that's through Boulder County Public Health. And so they track that information on their end because it's on their website. I thought but you where, were referring where's to the, uh, Where's the media campaign? Can we see it? I don't have, um, you should be able to, um, but I will, do some research and get back to you on that. Is that okay? And I'm sorry. Yeah, you bet. I, I just, I just love to see it. I haven't seen anything in the community. Oh, is that and Allison? I'm, I must be. Yeah, I think it. Allison can can step in okay. here. And the short answer is yes. We can we can get you some more information on that. But Allison, go ahead. Go for it, Allison. Yeah. So uh, that particular campaign was around um, vape use. I believe it was the all facts no cap campaign. Um, I can send some of the information and connect folks with my colleagues who were running that. Um, it was made by, um, by young people. They had a lot of really great engagement um, on TikTok, um, which is part of the reason why probably no one on this call has seen it um, because their ads were specifically targeted towards young people. Um, but let me see what I can find um, and maybe... Um, I can send it off to folks at City of Boulder um, and then connect anybody who's interested with my colleagues here. Uh, but it was in our uh, Tobacco Education Prevention Partnership team um, held that work and specifically around uh, youth vaping. And then just one follow-up, Jalia. Thank you for that, Allison. I appreciate it. I'd love to just see it. Um, in, the, in your presentation, I was just sort of trying to look for the things that were specifically about marijuana and cannabis this board is the cannabis licensing board and so just wondered what things were maybe the most focused on making youth aware of risks and downsides of marijuana use um good question um i am so one the major thing is that each agency has their own specific targeted agenda that they do with the youth and how they deliver that information. I'm actually in the process of doing site visits to see that work firsthand. Um, but maybe, uh, Elizabeth, are you able to help provide some support on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one, one um, reality for a lot of our uh, C fund grantees is that they're focused on risk perception um, generally as well as specifically for various substances, including marijuana. Um, same is true for kind of the trusted adult relationships. Um, it's about kind of establishing that perspective um, among youth. Actually, I'm going to stop screen sharing because then we can look at each other a little better here. Um, 
And so in some cases, there's a very specific focus on marijuana versus other, other substances and other times there's not. Um, one example, I think of an organization that has programming that is more focused on um, marijuana is uh, Natural Highs, where they're specifically talking about, and I think fo many folks here are familiar with that organization. Um, so they can focus really specifically on, on marijuana. Um, other organizations like the programming that the Y um, does is focused on having sober events and kind of talking to youth about the range of um, addictive substances, including marijuana, but not exclusive to that. So I think um, that is a good question that we can kind of go back and maybe Julia can get back in touch with a little bit more kind of granularity about the, pro uh, the programs that in 2022 very specifically looked at um, marijuana and focused on marijuana data, um, as opposed to kind of the general topic of risk perception, which applies to, to all drugs. Um, and I think, I mean, folks on this in this board know, and, and I think Allison can can chime in here as well, that it is that um, prevention structure um, that sometimes distinguishes, sometimes doesn't, um, where the risk perception differs from alcohol to marijuana to other substances. The Healthy um, Kids Colorado survey indicates that, where sometimes there is a substantial difference between the risk that um, youth ascribe to one addictive substances and not to another. So that's something that's really um, one of those topics that's discussed at the quarterly grantee meetings um, and that our colleagues with Boulder County Community Services will, will focus on um, with the grantees to help understand what those distinctions are, um, why youth folk think that one substance is less harmful than another um, and how that can impact um, their lives and choices moving forward. Anyone else with questions? Oh, and Stacy's here. But Stacy may not be able to be visible. Brian? Hi there. Um, but Elizabeth, you had mentioned that uh, the last time you came and presented to our board was kind of in the depths of the pandemic and things like that. So I wanted to know like how your programs and programming and priorities are changing as we kind of like exit a pandemic phase it's really how that is impacting uh the kinds of things that i know you mentioned you're in this kind of five-year cycle so maybe there's a little bit, bit of uh inertia baked in here but i just wanted to know like as we kind of enter the exit excuse me exit this pandemic phase how is that impacting uh some of your programming uh, and outreach efforts Sure, I can start here, Julia, and feel free to, to jump in since we collectively spanned um, the pandemic era. So initially, um, 2020, 2021, as, as I think everyone knows, um, the level of stress um, and that our youth were experiencing um, from the isolation, from all of the other impacts, um, not being able to go to school, not being able to socialize, was really concerning. And of course, there were a lot of impacts on C-funded programs themselves. Um, and our grantees, for the most part, were able to pivot, um, hold online events. Um, some of them worked quite well um, among youth to keep them engaged, even when they couldn't be together physically. There were some programs, such as the programs, um, the pillar programs that Julia mentioned earlier, that actually had a pretty phenomenal growth in participation because they were online um, and made accessible to many, many other uh, members of the community. So I think that was kind of one um, unintended outcome um, of the pandemic is that online became such more um, a positive platform for people to tap into educational programs and connect in that way. Uh, but for the most part, um, for the other grantees, it definitely was a challenge um, for them to really keep up with young people and keep them engaged in programming. What we've seen kind of coming out of the pandemic, um, and again, Allison, feel free to jump in here as well, um, is that heightened sense of awareness among youth themselves as they're seeing their, their, their friends, their classmates, um, you know, going through these stressors um, so closely linked to other mental behavioral health um, trauma that they're facing. And also among parents who are, again, well aware um, oftentimes of this increase in stress. Um, there have been some other positive developments, um, I think, in our 
with our eyes as um, funders or investment partners in this work. And that is include the school district um, kind of incorporating more of this work themselves. We actually had a reduction in need um, from the C fund to support programs like Sources of Strength, which they were able to increasingly fund um, as a part of the general programming for the district. Um, that's one example. Um, also the growth in many other organizations, including the four um, groups, as Julia mentioned, that we've brought into the funding program, Out Boulder County, SPAN, uh, uh, now I'm blanking on, on the other I two. Have course without looking. I have a dream. I Thank have a dream. Thank you very much. And Amistad. And Amistad. Um, these are organizations that had already had um, some level of programming um, on substance use prevention, and they've really ramped that up in the last couple of years, again, in part as a response to the increased need uh, that's being expressed by the young people. Um, so those are that's a couple of observations, pretty high level still, um, to say that obviously the need um, for these kinds of services, the awareness of the trauma, uh, and the impact on on kids through COVID was 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 pretty clear, and um, our organizations really we have been able to to step up and meet that demand. Having the addition of the vape fund, um, the vape uh, tax or the electronic smoking device tax to be added to what we already had from recreational marijuana um, tax sources was really helpful. It essentially doubled um, the kind of grant um, funding impact we had, um, and that again was just really great and able to enabling the city to step up and help meet that demand. Thank you. That's a great question, thank you. Others? So I have one question. Um, and first of all, thanks Elizabeth for all the time you've put in so far. And it sounds like maybe you're transitioning to a new role. And so we may or may not see you in the future, but it sounds like you've left it in capable hands. Um, and so Jolly, I'd like to ask you a question on, 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 now that we don't have the slides, I was gonna ask about the slide, the second to the last slide, there was something on it that, can we get that back up or? Caitlin, I believe here. This slide? Um, I'll tell you when I see it. It has something to do with, it has the pathways to prevention. Um, oh yeah, this one here. Yeah, so it uh, talks about, I don't remember if you highlighted this, these certified prevention specialists. Can you talk a little bit about that or, or both items really, but. Um, yes, and so, yes, so there are certificate programs that peers or adults um, that are engaged with the youth can take and actually become certified um, substance use prevention specialists. Um, and I mentioned, when I talked about this, I was talking about the fact that people can actually get certified for doing something that they're passionate about and being able to get jobs. And I know that in talking with our partner today at Boulder County Community Services, you know, they've been talking to some organizations that um, are looking to hire certified prevention specialists and a lot, uh, especially peer specialists and a lot of, um, a lot of clinical data and clinical program is going towards a peer based um, model because, you know, folks that folks will youth and others, you know, will usually, you know, have a, a, a baseline or a common ground with someone that has been in their position before. And so um, they are seeking um, peers to do this certified prevention specialist um, role here. And in addition, um, that community providers that can bill Medicaid are also looking to bring on um, certified prevention specialists that can actually be employed at organizations and work on a professional in a professional capacity as a prevention specialist, uh, whether they be peer or actual family uh, prevention specialists. And when it says seven enrolled, that's seven people currently enrolled in the program, is that? Yeah, it to, to date. 
um, that um, have enrolled and received the training through Boulder County Community Services through their Pathways to Prevention program. And do you have, an, are there any graduates of that yet or? I'm not quite sure. That's a great question. I'm happy to follow up on that. But the first one you're describing it, I was imagining like one of the high schools or several of the schools, middle schools and high schools would, some, somebody would be working with or be aiming to work with them. But now, now I'm hearing like Boulder Community Hospital or so, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting a different vision from what you just described if it you know, has something to do with insurance and or, or somebody could bill insurance better. Yeah, so, so my understanding there is that, um, you know, um, a lot of, you know, providers in the community are moving towards or would like to be able to bill Medicaid. And I'm sorry if I cause any confusion in that. But um, I had a, like a, a conversation with our partner and she was just talking about some of the potential avenues for uh, professional um, development and employment uh, for certified prevention specialists. And that would be something such as getting um, employed with an agency that is larger like a Boulder County, uh, a Boulder Community Health or any larger healthcare organization or agency that provides preventative um, prevention services to be able to, if that person is working for their agency and is a certified prevention specialist, that that service could be billed to Medicaid as a part of the, the um, services that they provide to the community. Hmm. Okay. One of the things I would just add very, very briefly, again, I think this board um, is probably aware of how, um, again, thinking about um, uh, board member Keegan's um, question about COVID impact, um, there's just been such an increase in need overall uh, for mental behavioral health services, including board member Noble as well aware of this, um, uh, including around substance use uh, prevention. And as Julia said, this um, prevention specialist approaches or for the certified prevention specialist and the peer and family support specialist is a way to help build that capacity of more people who are either already working somewhere in this area, including staff members of our nonprofit agencies that have some substance use uh, prevention programming to really take that next step in their own professional development and their capacity to better serve our community members. So over time, we hope that by, you know, removing the cost barrier um, that some organizations or community members would have saying like, gosh, I'd really love to get that certification, but it costs money to do that. And I don't necessarily have that supportive structure in place, um, people to supervise me in a workplace environment, um, to enable me to do the, you know, to participate in the classes and the study time. Um, so we aim through the C fund to help add a little bit more of our funding um, to remove that cost barrier and really provide um, this opportunity to people who are already working in this realm somehow. And over time, you know, by adding seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 community members, you know, in any given year um, to that pool of folks who are getting certified we're generally hoping to boost um, boost that level of capacity in our community. Thank you. Thank so, you for rounding out those edges there, Elizabeth. Julia, it sounds like you've hit the ground running understanding the different agencies and acronyms. Good job. I'm trying, thank you. Any other questions? Let me just ask uh, one more quick question. This, okay. I wondered, is the, the craft classes that are put on through Boulder County. Is that something that comes under C, C funding or is that separate or do you know? Um, I'm not sure I am, I'm not sure I understand. Um, when you say craft classes, I know that some of the agencies that we provide funding to will put on craft classes for their oh no i'm sorry uh, it's, it's different. a it's a specific curriculum for parents to oh, gotcha. when their kids start to dabble in substances it seems like it's been very effective for a lot of families and i just 
was wondering if that was under the C funding. Sorry, Jolly, I wasn't clear. Allison, you want to go ahead? I believe the funding for that um, is through the Behavioral Health Administration um, or through the Office of Behavioral Health at the state. Um, so my understanding is that it's not connected right now to the C fund um, and not run by community services. We can confirm it's, it's not funded through the C fund, although Jill, Anne, Julie is absolutely correct. Um, thinking about um, some of the activities that um, a Healthy Youth Alliance and um, some of the other agencies did during uh, COVID and since then, we're actually using online, you know, kind of little C um, craft classes um, to in, engage the youth in, in sober, sober activities. Just so everyone knows, I, I suspected it was an acronym, Community Reinforcement and Family Training. Uh, any, any other questions? Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, really appreciate it. Um, likely correct that next time you ask for a presentation, um, it will be Julia going solo, um, but always here to support um, her and um, any available to help answer any questions you might have about, um, about how the C Fund is creating this impact in our community. Well, thanks to the both of you. Thank, Thank you, you for all. your time. Okay. Um, now back to number four. Uh, continuing on into our agenda today is the policy suggestion forms received for the June meeting. In the packet, you did re receive one policy suggestion form. Um, so I will turn that over to you, Chair Kunzman. All right, everybody has seen the policy suggestion form, I'm assuming. Um, I don't have, uh, I, I, I missed the um, meeting that we planned this meeting. So Brian, do you remember, was there any discussion about how to, how to discuss this? I, I was busy doing a clinic survey. Uh, this didn't come up in our final meeting with staff, but um, again, so this is a policy suggestion form from uh, Aaron Spees with Native Roots um, regarding some changes in uh, statutory language uh, regarding um, how medical dispensaries need to set aside space. Um, so I don't know if other board members wanted to pick this up in some kind of way or um, or if the city attorneys had any input, uh, or I guess we would need to ask the city attorneys and staff to sort of consider this in some kind of way, but as a first read, if the city attorneys had any feedback on this. So I'm happy to jump in. Um, in terms of the procedure for this, it seems like, um, first and foremost, we would want to get some direction from this board if there's any interest in pursuing or having us do any work to look into this, um, that would be the first step. And then we could always come back with that information for a bigger, broader discussion from the full um, board. And then at that point, the board can make a decision on a recommendation on whether or not they wanna make any possible change to the code or not. Um, we did do just an initial look and uh, research into the issue. Andy did that for me. And um, it, it doesn't appear as though there would be any conflict per se in their request. However, as you all well know, um, local governments have the ability to um, add additional requirements and that, that are unique to their community. Uh, and that's what may have happened here. We're still trying to research the history to understand um, why that uh, additional requirement may have been included. And um, in addition to that, I think that it's important to note that 
um, while they may be um, asking for a removal of this, um, what is it called, the room, the uh, consultation room, that I think it actually has broader implications in the code because of the way that our code is drafted in terms of the fact that, um, you know, uh, it requires uh, for medical marijuana facilities, um, it requires some additional services be provided um, that are similar and consistent with a wellness center. So I think it's a, a broader discussion. Um, and so, as I mentioned, um, perhaps the board can have a discussion today on whether there's any interest in um, having us look into this further and we can always come back, but I think it would be important to have some consensus from the board um, to do that, because that would require some additional work. And Chair Klusman, I just want to recognize that the author of this uh, um, policy suggestion form is also in the room as well. If, oh. But um, Robin also has her hand. Yeah, Robin. I mean, I guess I would just say that absent some good information about what the original intent was of adding this on to the statute makes the conversation a little bit hard to have. I mean, what was the idea? Was it a privacy issue? Was it ensuring integrity in an actual medical process? What, what were those things? Because if we don't really understand that intent, then, you know, we're discussing changing something um, with some key missing information would be my input. So I'm, I'm happy to wait on this and get more information from the staff. Andy, did you have any further insight based on your research into this? Um, not, not too much more, but uh, I, I will note they've requested that three provisions be stricken and there's some overlap and just in terms of like that subsection H3, subsection H2, they don't just pertain to the separate room requirement. There's also language in there that basically speaks to uh, medical marijuana facilities operating other medical adjacent type services. And so I think we'd wanna be careful in sort of evaluating, you know, what both what the request is, but also making sure we understand the original intent and whether that would be consistent with the original intent. So I think that's all I have for you right now, Mr. Chairman. You can call me Tom. <laughs> right, Tom, thank you. Uh, so I'm just trying to like, rather than make assumptions, I'm trying to understand the history of uh, the events in Colorado. Uh, medical marijuana was approved before Recreational, is that correct? And, and right. so medical marijuana or our cannabis, whatever, we haven't got to that part in the agenda yet, but I'll call it marijuana right now. Um, so I'm wondering if they created that ruling back when that was established, akin to or analogous to a pharmacist needing to have a, a private consultation space. Um, that's what I'm imagining. I don't know if there's any truth to my imagination. Um, I think the, they have a valid point in that bud tenders don't exactly have a, a wealth of, well, I mean, they they have a lot of knowledge, um, but I don't know if they have a wealth of knowledge with respect to um, specifics of medical marijuana. Uh, Stacy. So forgive me if I'm not uh, answering this to what you're thinking, Tom, but I, my understanding or recollection was the doctors weren't supposed to be practicing on site for conflict of interest reasons. I believe that's why it was done away with. I think mm -hmm. when medical first came to Colorado, uh, there was basically facilities where the medicine was grown, distributed, patients were seen. It's like a one-stop shop. And I think there was concerns for, you know, ethical issues potentially coming up, conflicts of interest. And so uh, I believe that was at least at that point, what led to that 
changing, but I don't know if I'm on topic here enough to answer your question. And I apologize to everyone for being a little scattered here today. That's okay. You've got important things to do. Yeah, the Little League Championship's a big deal, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it, does, it only comes around probably once in a lifetime. I, I got four kids. This is the first one, and this is my youngest. So there you go. <laughs> so so these, anyways, that's my understanding of that. So anyone in the room, including Stacy, who would it have been designed for to use this consultation room? Um, when they had when when it was created, I, I, I'm having trouble envisioning that. I mean, I agree with you, Tom. And again, not having any familiarity with the legislative intent for this language, uh, but I think that your hypothesis, I think, would probably likely be borne out that this they're, they're maybe trying to emulate some sort of like pharmacy like code or intent mm -hmm. here. Um, again, if we had enough questions and if the board and chair are willing. I would also invite us to hear from Erin if she was able to speak, uh, to maybe provide some of that color for this if she's able to. But um, I think that we should continue to. But speaking of my capacity, I, I agree that the this legislative language creates the appearance of this be, uh, engaging in some sort of like medical consultation. I think is it appropriate for the kinds of um, training and qualifications that bartenders would have. And so I think that, uh, again, we want to understand that legislative intent, but I would want to also remove the appearance that this is a medical consultation that I think is not an appropriate uh, intent here. And Stacy, your hand is still up. Do you intend to have your hand still up? Oh, thank you. Oh, wait, it's back up. <laughs> um, so confusing. Well, so was Aaron present? for the period of time during public comment, because we can't see who's in the room anymore. So do you know whether, because we, we have allowed special circumstances where we allow someone to speak outside of the public comment period, but then we also opened it up to others, if I remember, who were not present during the public comment period. And I can see some benefit in allowing Aaron to speak, but. I also don't want to be unfair or presumptuous. Certainly. Um, Chair Kunzman Erin um, did message through the chat. Um, she was here. Um, she wants to thank for the, including the policy suggestion from the agenda today. She is here on the call and would welcome the chance to answer any questions from the CLAB members if that might help the conversation. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone, I'm all for getting more information, even before if we put this off to making any decisions at, until some future meeting, but um, is there anyone opposed to hearing from Aaron? Robin, you have your microphone off or on. No, that's fine. I mean, again, I just really feel like we need the staff to give us the background on that, but I'm, but I'm open to hearing what she has to say. Well, I think we can do both. Not, not all today, but. Uh, hearing no one opposed, uh, how about we give Aaron three minutes or less? And we do just like we do public comment? Certainly, I can open up a Google Timer. And I will promote to allow her to talk. Oh, her hand is up. All right. Hello, Aaron. Hi, Christine. Will... Can you hear me? I can. So um, are you able to see your screen? I can see, uh, oh, now I see a black box with my name in it. Okay, mm -hmm. so I am going to um, share my screen with a three minute timer and I will let you know when that timer begins. Gotcha. Can you see the timer, Erin? Sure can. Certainly, your time begins now. Great, thanks. Hi, Chair Kuntzman and uh, CLAB members. Thanks for letting me jump on and thanks for devoting part of the agenda to this policy suggestion form. Um, I think it's, uh, you, you guys covered the, the object of the game uh, as far as I'm concerned really well. Um, you know, to be, be really clear, uh, I'm representing Native Roots. We have two stores in Boulder. One of them is just adult use on Pearl Street. 
And then we also have a medical only location called the Dandelion, which is on Walnut Street. And this requirement for, there's two requirements that pertain to our medical store. That's 6147H2 and 6147H3. And those requirements hey, Aaron. say that number, yep. Aaron, hold on a second. Kristen's, oh, sure. Kristen's <laughs> this is where I was gonna make a joke with uh, Andy that- I apologize. Andy over, overseeing IT, everything should work perfectly for him. Uh, but <laughs> uh, there we go. Let's try one more time on, on the timer. Okay. You understand we were seeing your- Yes, I apologize. That's okay. Oh, now we Is have an just... advertisement. One moment. <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. No problem. You were on a roll. <laughs> Not at all. Now. Okay. Well, no, still. I could hold my watch up to the. Um. One moment. I don't know why it won't come off of there. One moment. I can jump in for you, Kristen, if you need. Thank you. It's like I've got it up, but it won't. How about now? There you go. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Sure. So yeah, thanks again. Um, and I think it, I think it was Robin uh, mentioned an interest in knowing the legislative intent behind this rule, especially the rule about requiring medical marijuana stores in Boulder do other things besides dispense marijuana. So so we can't only dispense marijuana. We must also provide some other holistic medicine or uh, alternative medicine service. Um, I'm also very curious about the legislative intent. I don't have any um, insights on what sparked that rule. I think that was likely before uh, I began in the industry, but um, also very curious. What I suspect though, is that um, whatever we find the intent to have been, that it's likely, this rule has likely outlasted um, its utility or at least common practice in Boulder. And one thing um, I just wanted to say, I think it was Andy mentioned that the scope here is kind of broad because I've included that provision as something that I think would be worth striking, which is 6147H2. Um, I think what Andy mentioned is, you know, that's a bigger scope change than just eliminating the, the requirement for this one private cubby or, or room. And the only thing I wanted to note there, I think that's totally correct, but I would just note that eliminating or striking that provision wouldn't inherently prohibit any medical dispensaries from continuing to offer acupuncture or aromatherapy or the other example uh, services that were on there. But I think it would eliminate the requirement that they do such. So um, uh, also it looks like I'm not running out of Time. Oh, were you like mistaken? You were you were given three hours instead of three. Yeah, minutes. yeah. apologies. <laughs> so you have one more minute. That's all. I, I'm done. Less. I think that's that's all. You, yeah. Let me know if you have questions, but um, I'll, I'll I'll cap it there. Okay. Um, questions for Aaron? I kind of wish Evan was here because he might be able to tell us a little bit of history, um, but he's not. So. So all the more reason we might want to get more information and come back to this. But questions since we have Erin on her three hour timer. <laughs> I guess just a, not a question for Erin, but I would just want to do, I don't know if the board can do a not of five kind of equivalent like the council does, but I guess I would like to sort of direct uh, staff the attorney's office to uh, term the legislative intent of uh, this uh, part of the code uh, and then consider um, if there are any other kinds of implications uh, associated with striking the, the relevant language for having consultation rooms as well. I can make that a formal motion, I guess, or a nod if five is sufficient. Okay, but just one last check before we discuss that. Any other questions for Aaron, or we'll officially put her back in the waiting room?
Seeing none, let's discuss Brian's suggestion. It did not sound like a motion. Uh, right now, somehow you're mute, but you don't look. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yeah, I agree with Brian's suggestion. Appreciate um, this person bringing this forward. Thank you, Aaron. And I think we just need a little more history and then we can probably you know, move forward more productively, but thank you. Staff, is there other color we can provide or questions we can give you better direction on, Paige? No, I think you're fine. I think as long as, it, as there is enough interest by the majority of the board to, to move forward and have us look into it and spend time on it, uh, I think that's what would be important to understand. I haven't heard from Ethan or um, uh, I'm not sure if there was anyone else that um, needed to weigh in, but um, as long as the, there's a majority, it, I don't think you need a motion. I just think, you know, as long there just needs to be enough interest is all. I think the things to clarify are history or the timeline and how it got to where it is and um, what the ramifications for the continuing of it, as well as ramifications for uh, changing. Uh, Ethan? Yes, I certainly think it's worth the time um, exploring this in a little bit more detail. Um, in, in my opinion, I think it's actually in alignment with some of the discourse that was had uh, during the um, hyperemesis panel where I think everybody was uh, in of the same opinion that these medical advice um, scenarios most likely shouldn't be occurring um, from individuals, specifically bud tenders. Um, that should be left up to the professionals with the licenses um, and ability to do that. Um, so willing to continue this discussion in the next next meeting provided that we get some more clarity on the the intent great thank you so we'll take that direction uh, we'll do our best to come back at the next meeting with some information give us a little time to look into that legislative history and um, also any potential implications um, so i think we've got our marching orders and thank you <laughs> it's easy for you to say because you're not going to be here. So, Andy, you're okay with all that too? Yep, of course. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and Kristen, Kristen, Caitlin, Riwa, anyone else? Got that? Okay. Um, so, I'm looking at the time and I'm trying to figure out whether this is a good time for a break or should we wait until after the next agenda item? Anybody have a strong opinion? I would say this feels like a good breaking time. Yeah, it does. This one? Yes. Okay, all right. How about, I'm gonna be, um, I don't know, luxurious, 10 minutes. So 4.43. Thank you. Ah, now we're official, okay. Um, so I don't have the agenda. It's like item six, right? Correct. Agenda item number six, discussion regarding May meeting policy suggestion form, amending code to replace the term marijuana with cannabis. And maybe in the spirit of equity and fairness, and since I can't see who's in the waiting room. Is Jeff Gard in the waiting room? Jeff Gard is not in the waiting room. He was, but he's no longer in there. Ah, okay. All right. If he reappears, will you let me know? Yes, I will. Was it, did he get off recently? Um, honestly, I don't know exactly what time he got off, um, but it was a while ago. Okay. No, sorry, not in your expectations. I'm just curious. Um, 
Okay, so um, Brian, you can clue me in, but I was hoping maybe to get further insight from Andy. I mean, he has this nice, how many, how many pages is this? Three pages? Um, but maybe we just hit the highlights and, and trans, <laughs> translate it from legalese into something the rest of us can understand. Sure, so yeah, sorry about the length. Um, the, uh, I think the essence of it is, is the board reviewed the policy suggestion concerning um, basically changing all of the references uh, to marijuana to cannabis. And as I noted in the memo, I couldn't opine on sort of the history of the usage of marijuana or its implications. Um, its racial implications or any other biases or prejudices that it may, um, you know, sort of represent. But um, I kind of looked at it just from a practical issue of, of what would this mean and, and what are, what's sort of the language that the state uses, some of the other municipalities use. Um, and we had a discussion, or I had a discussion with staff as well to go over this. And the essence of it is, um, one, I'll say there's probably a lot of people on this call that have more expertise than I do about any of this, the distinctions and different, type, uh, different types of cannabis and what's encompassed within cannabis and everything else. But um, just as a practical matter, the, the, the word marijuana is used, I guess, basically throughout the Boulder Revised Code. Um, there are references to cannabis and there are many more references to marijuana. And just in, I think it's chapters 14 and 15, which relate to medical marijuana and the, and the recreational marijuana. Um, I think there was 1,094 references to, to the words marijuana. And so, um, I did want to kind of tee this up with that memo to sort of explain some of that perspective and how um, there are scientific distinctions at issue as well. Um, but that doesn't mean this isn't something that the board couldn't either investigate further or take up. Um, but we just, we did want to make sure you were aware that there might be technical distinctions between marijuana and cannabis that we really need to look at all of those references in the code to make sure we're drawing the correct distinction as we need to, if we were going to make any changes or, or make, a, make a recommendation to make any changes. So I hope that te teed it up for you all a little bit, 50,000 foot views, so. And I'll just jump in here and I'll add that. So I spent uh, so my email to staff um, attached there. So I spent some time just poking around the city revised code, just trying to look where sort of this language appears, which chapters and context that appears. So uh, if you're looking at the reading packet on uh, page, page 28 and 29, I think, 27, 28. Uh, includes that email where I sort of did my sort of version of due diligence that is um, around just like where this kind of language appears. Um, for me, the, 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 the fly in the ointment here is really hemp. Uh, so the existence of hemp as a distinct kind of regulatory category um, defined at both the federal level and then inheriting all the way down. Um, but like, again, so hemp as his definition of any cannabis that contains less than 0.3% by dry weight. Uh, and so I think that it is uh, just me opining here that this kind of like carve out for hemp is really just um, a political policy abstraction that has no real basis in any kind of sort of meaningful scientific uh, uh, kind of difference between these plants. They're genetically almost identical. And so it's really the fact that some plants make more PHC and some plants make less. Uh, and so I think until my, my sense is, I just wanted to share that my sense, my opinion would be that um, given the pervasiveness of this language, the fact that sort of we have to grapple with this sort of carve out that exists for hemp 
that all these concerns about sort of redefining or sort of uh, removing the term marijuana from code, you know, it seems premature until we have an opportunity to just sort of define cannabis as an all encompassing sort of definition uh, and then not have to sort of grapple with sort of marijuana as everything that's not hemp because we've decided to sort of create this carve out for hemp. Um, but again, it's just kind of fascinating all the different ways in which it is defined the ways that shows up in different parts of the city code. So I appreciate um, all the effort that Andy made in sort of pulling this information together, providing this kind of background. So I just want to convey my thanks as well. Others, Ethan, Robin? Uh, well, I would echo Brian's thanks to Andy. That was a really terrific memo, good background, et cetera. And Brian, I appreciated your thoughts on it too. I'll just tell you that for me, um, using a word like cannabis, I think is less precise for somebody who advocates for transparency and more studies and understanding of the implications of the psychoactive part of this plant, THC. Um, and so I, I really hate that this is potentially hurtful to a community. I think that's very problematic, but I also think we have to be precise because, um, and if this is where we are right now, where we understand marijuana to be psychoactive and, you know, this valuable part of the plant CBD to be non psychoactive. Um, I think that distinction is really important. And if you say cannabis, you're talking about both things. So I think that's problematic. And so I wouldn't support making the change um, at this time for all of those reasons um, and the things that Andy described about just linguistically having some of those challenges. Ethan, any thoughts on? Yes, if I remember correctly, um, in the last meeting, Jeff Gar did mention that he's aware that the governor's office is in currently in process of working to phase out marijuana um, already. Um, I would hate to task the city staff with work that would more or less be redundant if we go through all the the painstaking efforts to strike out marijuana, replace it with cannabis, and then the state, you know, makes their own changes that would require us to double back and, and redo the same work twice. Uh, so I think it's it's in our best interest to maybe reach out to the to the state and see what their intentions are and in a in a perfect world scenario, we could roll out, you know, the city of Boulder's amendments somewhat in line with or on the same timeline with the, the state's intentions as well. So I think we we wouldn't want to make you know any hasty decisions now, perhaps need to open up that discourse with with the state first to better understand their intentions and plans. That was coming up for me, Ethan, knowing that there might be some other things moving, um, that it, I think conceptually it makes sense to explore, but I feel like the exploration at this point of looking at um, the, great, the great memo and looking at how many things would need to change and knowing that there's some movement in other places feels like it's not the right time to go further, but something to keep in mind. Uh, then I just wanted to add one thing, and this is mostly for uh, Andy to be cognizant of because it predates his time on the, but um, Officer Gignac did, this is just pursuant to um, his section B, so like on the reading packet, page 25. Um, it's just, again, it's kind of talking about, um, again, this distinction between cannabis and marijuana that, um, but, uh, in Boulder, because of this wild loophole that exists in the hemp bill that was passed by Congress, um, it is permissible for unlicensed businesses to tell to sell a THC-containing substances 
uh, as long as they fall below this 0.3% uh, by dry weight uh, sort of threshold. So um, I just wanted to sort of raise for uh, Andy, in case he wasn't aware that Officer Gidniak did investigate this and did share a one page letter sort of uh, sharing this. I don't know if Officer Gidniak, you want to share more about this or if you've got updates on that since. Pam has her hand up. Go ahead, Pam. Um, yeah, I've raised my hand because I can reach out to the state med tomorrow to see if they've heard anything about the governor's interest in striking the word marijuana. And I can get that back to the licensing staff. Um, in regards to the uh, levels of THC that are allowed legally, I did research that with the state. Um, because there were some issues about a, a drink that was going around that had a certain level of THC. And unfortunately it's legal because it is under the level that uh, the science defines uh, marijuana, uh, the level of THC that it needs. Um, so they still acknowledge that anything below the certain level is, is considered hemp and anything above is considered marijuana and falls under the, the regulatory rules. And just to clarify, is, is that a state rule or is that a federal rule and is that FDA or which? Uh, it's, it's both. No. Oh. Are they in agreement at least? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, oops. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. Um, Colorado G General Assembly in the in the last session that just closed passed a bill that put some greater uh, regulation on products that contain THC that are derived from hemp, and that's Senate Bill twenty three two seventy one. If anyone wants to look at it a little further, but it's a little more robust regulation on hemp products derived from THC products derived from hemp. But I agree with the rest of the board that uh, I'm grateful for Jeff and other members of the community for raising this as an issue. It is a live issue. Um, but I also share the sense of the board that um, this is a very complicated regulatory sort of um, issue to, to change the code if it, you know this term appears thousands of times in the code and like these definitions uh, are shifting in response to state and federal things that we should sort of uh, wait our turn in line for those changes to come down to us. And then I think we should lead and coordinate in ways that allow us to make those changes uh, in combination with others. I would also echo uh, everyone's um, gratefulness for Andy putting this together. And I would also echo that I think we're all in sympathy with Jeff's intention, um, but it's not a matter of just like back in the good old days, you could take Microsoft words and have, you know, have it find marijuana and change them all to cannabis. Uh, I'd be a lot of changes, first of all. Um, and I find it curious that when I tried to Google federal rules regarding cannabis. It just steered me to marijuana every time. Uh, but in the state, this is a question for Andy that I don't know if you got a chance to look at. I know I hear what's happening in Colorado. I wonder if other states have moved in that direction of changing terminology or clarifying terminology. Because California, interestingly, when I Googled, uh, you know, what I just said, cannabis, or federal rules regarding cannabis. The fifth thing that came up was California rule, or, you know, and it was all it was all cannabis terminology. Not, I mean, it mentioned marijuana, but cannabis was the number one term it appeared. Um, so I'm just curious as to whether other states have jumped ahead of us on clarifying this. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know that answer. I pretty much just looked through throughout Colorado and Oddly enough, the Marijuana Enforcement Division has, um, I believe it was their web, web page, that's Cannabis Colorado. Um, so there is some sort of like interchangeability in terms of uh, some of that usage, but I, 
Um, I mean, it, it seems like Colorado definitely hasn't shifted away at this point from using the term marijuana. Um, so that's kind of kind of where I landed. Um, and that's that's helpful to know too that there might be some action taken at the state level to make that change. Um, so we can definitely look into that for the board and staff and I will look into that. But um, at this at this point, yeah, I'm not sure I have much more info for you. So I know you were working down at the state level, but I think you live in Boulder, but I'm not sure about that. I think I remember hearing that. Um, no, I, I don't live in Boulder. Oh, yeah. okay. sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Uh, but, but we here in Boulder like to think that we like to lead the world, uh, and we sometimes get that wrong, but, uh, but we still like to think that. Um, one thing, I, I mean, so th this has been a, this whole landscape changes on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. I mean, you know, this is all it's been evolving over more than a decade and it's going to continue to evolve. Um, I mean, just today I got an inkling that, um, what's her name? The CU Change Lab. Who is it, Brian? Um, Cinnamon Bidwell? Nope, the other one, head of the... Angela. Angela Bryan, yeah, is, is going to, is putting together a research proposal to study different concentrations of THC and is trying to get an in, uh, investigational new drug, uh, whatever you call it, exception. Um, and so I don't know how that's going to fly, you know, with state rules, federal rules, university rules. Um, we'll see. Just add enough water and it's not marijuana anymore. It's hemp. <laughs> I guess. Um, as I you know, I guess what I was trying to say is that we'll just have to adapt to whatever comes next. But I do, I do find it interesting that the city council at the time when they created this board had the wherewithal or the insight to not call it the marijuana board, they called it the cannabis board. Um, so that's just kind of interesting. But anyways. So uh, to come up with a conclusion, uh, we're going to put this on the back burner. We'll be sympathetic, but yeah, I say we should revisit this if there's movement at the state level. And do you think that each one of us will probably keep track of that independently, or do we need an assignment along that line, or? It's going to happen. I mean, whatever happens, happens, right? I may just say that um, Kristen Watkins is in the governor's office. He's on a short list of speakers for a future CLAD meeting. So that might be a question we can pose to Dr. Watkins at a future meeting if we invite him. Okay. All right. Um, what's next? I have to scroll back up to see the agenda. That would be agenda item number seven, matters from the city attorney. And I really don't have anything. Uh, obviously, the biggest news is uh, Andy joining um, this group. And, um, there, you know, there may be some um, additional work uh, that um, we would look into um, by CAO, but and I'm thinking particularly of the rules of procedure, but that looks like uh, something that's going to be listed uh, as one of the items under the um, licensing office, matters for under the licensing office. So um, I'll wait and see uh, what direction we get from you all about that. Um, but I think uh, we have at least one assignment from this meeting. And so that's all that I have. I don't know, Andy, if you had anything else that you wanted to add? Nope, that's it. Okay. And Andy, you'll contact us each individually to see if we can arrange some time to... Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be reaching out. Um,
probably in the next couple of weeks, I'll probably just stagger some meetings and just reach out and touch base and not, no pressure, but it would be good to meet with you all, so. Okay. And you have our phone numbers, I'm presuming, right? Or you have access to our phone numbers? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, matters from the regulatory licensing office. Yes, agenda item number eight. We will begin with our rules of procedure discussion. Licensing manager, Chang Garris. Thank you, Kristen. So um, in your packet, we have some draft rules of procedure and these date back to 2020 when the board was um, originally formed. And from what I could gather um, back in 2020, it sounds like the board discussed these rules of procedure um, but never actually formally adopted them. So we just wanted to revisit that to see um, if that's something that the board would be interested in informally adopting or making any changes to um, the draft that was written back in 2020. What page is that? I'm, I'm scrolling through. Page 39, 38. Oh, I scrolled too fast. Oops. Okay. Yeah, there was a lot going on in May 2020, wasn't there? Uh, there was a lot, yes. So have we ever discussed this? Sorry? Have we ever discussed this? They would they were presented to, to the board, <clears throat> excuse me, back in May of 2020. So it's 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 been a while since these were discussed. And it, using um, the beverage licensing board as a model, have they had any changes or practices for their rules of procedure that have changed in any meaningful way since May 2020? Sure. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, these rules of procedure were um, copied from the BLA rules of procedure for our liquor board. Um, although I will say they are much shorter than the BLA rules of procedure because BLA acts as a quasi judicial board, and that's not something that CLAB has taken up yet. Um, so the the BLA has made some changes to their rules over the years, but it's mostly related to um, rules of procedure for public hearings and, and things of that nature. Um, I can't, I'd have to do a comparison, but I can't recall um, any changes to the topics that are outlined in these draft rules of procedure that we provided to you. Um, the only difference that I noticed, and I'm not sure if it was right or not, but um, besides those additions of how you hold a public hearing and define a neighborhood and stuff like that, um, is their quorum is different than ours, I think. Is their quorum is three, right? Yeah, our there quorum are. Is four. Sorry, they're, they're a smaller board. It's a um, five-person board, so that's why their quorum is smaller. Just generally speaking, looking at these, they seem accurate to the way we've operated for the last, you know, several years, and I didn't see anything that needed that needed to be changed that I could see. My question to staff is that are we operating in a breach by not having formally approved these rules of procedure, and should we just approve them so that we cover our butts and then we can revise them in the future as we see fit. Um, but yeah, are we operating in a breach right now? I guess would be my question that the city's I, I don't think you're in a breach. Uh, I'll just jump in. Sorry, Kristen, I didn't uh, interrupt you if you were going to speak. Um, you know, the, what's interesting, yeah, is that um, there isn't necessarily any requirement that there be rules of procedure for this board. Um, so um, I think it would be important to make sure that um, there was at some point a motion um, by the board approving the rules. Um, 
that are in place just to kind of legitimize it, but I don't think that there's anything um, that you've been doing wrong, wrong. You know, it sounds like you've been practicing what's in there already. So, yeah. So, in um, tangential to Brian's question, is it really our board's um, purview to approve this, or is it more the city council? It's it's you. It's this board because there's no requirement that city council approve it, whereas the beverage licensing authorities' rules procedure do require council approval. This board does not. And there's many other boards that don't require council. Okay, I read with curiosity the second to the last paragraph on page 42. Um, the, I, I've always thought that we've tried to resemble Robert's rules of order, um, maybe not to the T, um, but I do, you know, just a warning, Andy, that I sometimes seek advice or uh, trying to do things by Robert's Rules of Order, but it says right there, Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised 1981, shall not be applicable to proceedings of the club. I don't know where that came from. I don't remember ever reading that. Um, and, and by the way, Robert's Rules of Order is on a 12th edition, and 2020 is the most recent version, not 1981. Um, now, I don't know if it's changed much. I, I did not order the book. I think this is just a get out of jail free card that we run things a little bit looser than Robert's rules. So I think that's, we, we approximate a, a procedure. That's exactly right. I think that's the theory behind it. Does the alcohol board use Robert? Does any, does the city council, does anyone use Robert's rules of order? So the city council has its own council rules of procedure that it follows. And if it's not addressed in the council rules of procedure, then they will default to the Roberts rules. But uh, generally speaking, they, that's not the first approach. And I think for the reason that Brian just mentioned, it just makes it cumbersome sometimes and, and, and difficult to actually run a meeting. Um, so. Um, it's not unusual that um, the Roberts Rules of Order would not be the first approach to take in more of a default that wasn't addressed in the rules. Hmm. Well, just FYI, Andy, that if you go back historically and you look at who has made motions and seconded them, I, I don't think you'll see my name because I had been living by Robert's Rules of Order, which the chairperson is not supposed to make motions or second, or we're just supposed to guide others. Um, and it doesn't matter to me much. I just. I, I think that's still a great approach to take. So, um, yeah. To, because it invites discussion from other board members, right? Um, so I think it's probably still a good approach to take. Robin? The only other issue that I flagged was on page 41, and it's like the third paragraph down, about when Boulder City Council can hear our recommendations. It, it puts, it says once a year as necessary. And I wonder, should that say once a year or as necessary? Or should there be a little more clear definition there? Because I, that's a question we come back to round and round and round every time we talk about something. Well, how do we give this to the council? And so maybe you guys could think about that. Maybe there's a better way to clarify that. Brian, I, 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 was, I got a comment on that too, but go ahead, Brian. Oh, this is a new topic, so I'll let you comment first. Oh, okay, so in, in, in medicine, the professors that teach the different body parts always think that their body part is the most important body part, and they drill that into medical students. And so in that vein, the cannabis board is the most important board on the city, you know, for the city of Boulder. And so we think that, you know, the, the city council is just waiting, you know, maybe midnight tonight, they're going to read through our minutes or tomorrow morning or something like that. Probably not true. 
Um, but we still like to think that. So Brian, sorry, just a bit of levity. Thanks, Tom. Um, in regards to taking up our quasi-judicial uh, powers, you're like a superhero. Uh, <laughs> would there be any meaningful changes required to these rules of procedure as they're currently uh, presented? Um, Kristen, I know you'd mentioned that these kind of predated um, that capacity, but now we're, that we're in the midst of picking up that mantle, like would these need to be altered or revised in some way to reflect that? I'll, I'll chime in. I don't, I don't know that these would need to be revised, but we would definitely want to add rules on the end, similar to what the BLA has done. So. All right. Thank you. And I had pulled up, I can't find it now because I have too many windows open, but um, there was a link to the BLA rules of procedure. Is it, is it easy to find? I'm looking at a list of 12 to 13 things here. That's page number 13. Or I'm sorry, page 37 in your packet. Oh, OK. So I don't need to go looking. I, I, I was looking at the documents. What was, what was the number again? 30. Page 37. OK. Oh yeah, so that's the link. Okay, so I did. Okay. And is it the which document is it of these twelve or thirteen choices here? Would it be the amendment? That's twenty eight um, pages. So currently, there's twenty nine pages which includes the cover sheet to the Boulder Beverage Licensing Authority Rules of Procedure. Okay, so maybe the, the top one might be the top choice on that web page. Um, the link should open directly to the Rules of Procedure. Oh no, I got, I got a pick list. But I think it's the top one on the list. So it would be the version that was adopted April 30th. I'm sorry, April 20th, 2023. Okay. All right. Other. Does staff need any particular direction or we need to just do our homework and find a place from the beverage life casino board. Uh, we'd like to hear from the board if you'd like to adopt these rules of procedure as is, or if there's any changes you'd like to make, um, please let us know so we can make those changes and present them to you in an updated form. Would you like to hear those now or should we just email you with comments? And... Either is fine. Does anybody have any comments off the top or, or up front? The only the only thing I I think did you guys register the the question I had about on page forty one? It was that did that would be something I'd like clarity on. I do Otherwise, I didn't see anything that was problematic in these. These seem consistent with how we've operated. If we're intending on adopting our quasi-judicial responsibilities here um, relatively soon, I think it's certainly appropriate to, to add on those additional chapters as needed. Thanks, so you can just build on Ethan's question here that if we wanted to emulate the 
beverage licensing authorities procedures here is it best to kind of do this in a piecemeal fashion where we like add a chapter and approve the chapter at a time or approve them wholesale is a big old project the staff have a sense about the best way to kind of go about incorporating the additional procedures here above what's already captured such as emulating the BLAs I'll just jump in, I, although I'm not going to be doing the work, and it seems better to just do it all at once rather than piecemeal, but I would defer to uh, other staff members and if they have other thoughts, but it seems like that would be a cleaner way to go. And I, I was just going to add, I'm, I'm happy to take a first shot at incorporating these additional chapters and converting them to CLAB uh, I guess appropriate language and then it will make it lengthier so that might be a little bit more of involved discussion at the time of adoption but that shouldn't be I mean the the BLA has a really good format and system right now so um, we could probably get that to you for the next meeting if you like it'll be a challenge because it's going from two and a half pages to potentially 25 pages, um, but clearly some of the things in the BLA, um, even in the table of contents, are not going to be applicable to us. Bed and breakfast permits. Um, yeah, like right. But I think that's a good idea to put a, f a first shot past us. Yeah, I would welcome if Andy in the attorney's office wanted to take a shot at translating the BLAs or the cannabis board for us to review at a future meeting. Ethan, what do you think? I wholeheartedly agree. Robin? That makes four of us. Four out of four. That's our quorum, according to our, our bylaws. Okay, that, um, that's great. Yeah, we'll we'll get on that and we'll work internally and try to get you something for next meeting. So, okay. Um, are we back to any other matters from the? Regular? Certainly, we have agenda topics for future CLAD meetings. So one was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is on page. It's the last page, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's been some texting or emailing about whether Nathan Dewey is available or if we wanted to have him. And then also an email back from, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, John Simat, Simat. Yeah, Robin, you had talked a bit about this. And so maybe you just want to share a little bit more about Nathan and inviting him. Yeah, Nathan, when I contacted him to talk to us about cannabis hyperemesis, um, he said, you know, I have this group. I'm very interested in getting more licensees involved. And I'd love to come and talk to the club about what I do and how my organization can make the environment in Boulder safer and better for consumers. Um, and so he wanted to come and make a presentation to CLAB, sounded very sincere. And I know this group, RAR, the Responsible Area Retailers, has been referenced lots of times by different CLAB members during other discussions. So I'd certainly be opening to, open to hearing um, his presentation if the rest of the board is. I would welcome that. I agree. Tommy muted. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I got you, Ethan. Uh, Brian, you had mentioned Tristan Watkins. He's not on schedule. We, we have nobody 
schedule to speak in the near future, right? I defer to staff, but I don't believe so. Okay. Did I see a communication maybe in the packet between the CU School of Public Health, that, um, Dr. Cmat, who agreed he would be happy to come and make a presentation on the findings? They, they were released their report since our last meeting. I think he gave a name of someone who would be appointed to figure out who would speak. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Going gotcha. Back through. What page is that on again? Let's see. Um, 47, I believe. Oh, yeah. I just didn't go back far enough. I think he was just referring to an assistant who can help make the arrangements. Okay. And she was CC. Okay, so I guess we just need to come to a conclusion that what, where we are at for, for priorities. I would definitely welcome presentations from both Dr. Samat, Samat and uh, Nathan Dewey. I agree. I echo that. Those seem to be two high priority people that we should hear from. So lower down, you would put anything from the change lab and or Jonathan Singer and or Kristen Watkins. And I have one more suggestion to add to the list also. Go ahead. You want me to add it? Since it since it seemed to um, get attention in the newspaper article, um, I've been looking into finding one or more speakers to address this age difference between 21 and 25, and why we chose to go with 25. And um, and I think there's I'm, I'm getting some insight from other folks. Um, as to who might be able to address those issues, uh, you know, the brain development and how cannabis might affect people in different stages of brain development. So I don't have a name yet, but I would reserve a place on the list somewhere, but no, not in the near future. Brian, have you had any conversation with Cinnamon or anybody from that lab? Uh, no, not recently. I just know through my kind of research article alerts that um, her lab had a number of papers just come out recently, but I haven't had a chance to dive into them yet. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, they're you know intending to do more stuff. I wanted to mention, um, since we're talking about, sorry, Tom, go ahead. No, no, go, you go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, since the CU study, the School of Public Health study came out, um, in the ensuing month, another study came out of Denmark that is a pretty groundbreaking study because it followed 6 million people. And I, tried to include it in the packet, but it was it came out a little too late. I'll put it in the next packet. But the researchers in this study concluded that um, as many as 30% of cases of schizophrenia <clears throat> among men ages 21 to 30 might have been averted by averting cannabis use disorder. And I think this is something that would be great for us to understand as a group the implication of this particular study because it's so large and it's in all the medical journals right now. JAMA's got it, Psychological Medicine has it, somebody's laughing, but um, it it's a big study and it's really concerning. And um, 
I, I don't know if we could have a speaker to come in and speak about that particular study, but that seems like kind of an urgent thing for the industry to understand and for consumers to understand if that is an existential risk. So I would submit that. And again, I'll put that in the next packet, um, try to send it to a couple folks ahead of, ahead of time, but I'd appreciate the board's consideration of that new study. I, my, I don't, I'm not sure I got the audio when you said, is that for schizophrenia or what is, what is that for? Um, the, the study concluded that as many as 30% of cases of schizophrenia among men ages 21 to 30 could have been prevented by first pre preventing cannabis use disorder. It made a very strong association between cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia. Okay. Well, that might go along with the speaker that I'm trying to find. Exactly, Tom. That's why I brought it up. Just what you were talking about there. Okay. Do we have any um, information that suggests that Jonathan Singer wants to come speak with us? Or is that just a name that got thrown out? Man, he's an interesting guy and I like him, but does he want to come speak with, with us? He might actually understand some of the rules or you know, some of the things, the history. Um, but I don't know what, I don't know who proposed Jonathan. Anybody? Okay. So do you want to try to do two speakers? Whenever, we're going to discuss when the next meeting is also, right? Um, you want to try to do two speakers? I think, yeah, if we could get Nathan Dewey and John Samad, I think there's a strong consensus around getting them to come speak. So I, I would want to prioritize them if that was Again, J July seems unlikely. We'll talk about that in a minute here, but um, yes, a future meeting. And do, do you want to choose one over the other? Or? Let's go for both. Oh, okay. And, and do you want a city staff? Do you want to make the next inquiry or do you want me to send another message first? We're happy to, to reach out directly and help facilitate. Um, but if you'd like to do that and get back to us, either either way is fine. How about you do it and CC me? Sounds good. So we we um, acknowledge your reply to Dr. Kunstman and would like to schedule how soon or you know. How's that sound? Sounds good. We'll reach out to him, make sure you're CC'd on there. Okay. And uh, who wants to do Nathan? Or you're already in discussion with him, Rob, is that correct? Yeah, I'm happy to reach out to him. Let's let's decide what date we're meeting next so we can. Okay. Well, but yes, I'm happy to reach out to him. Yep. Good segue, when's the next meeting? So um, one of the things that I can do is I can definitely clean up um, we've been just adding to this list, but I can maybe do a strike through for things that we've already discussed, if that would help make it clear or just reorder it um, for the suggestions for future meetings, if that would help. Sure, that'd be great. Perfect. Okay. And then, so we do have a couple of quorum and attendance items coming up next. Um, the first one is quorum and attendance notification. Um, staff would just request that if you're going to be absent um, and you're going to email the chair or the vice chair, if you would please make sure to include staff on that email as well. Um, that way we know whether or not we have a potential to maybe not have a quorum because some people just email us 
versus um, just the, the chair or the vice chair. So they all kind of need to be centralized so that staff knows whether or not we're at risk at having to um, cancel the meeting and reschedule because it goes out on the public website. So we just ask if everybody could remember to please do that. And then moving on to the question of the hour, the July 3rd meeting quorum. Before you go now on, that, before you go yes? on, you need to make sure that everyone who, especially those that are not in attendance today, get that same message. We so. can do that. Okay, Sandra. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one quick thing related to um, just, uh, you know, we're still operating under virtual um, meeting um, procedures. And um, I, I think I know that it would be important for um, the folks that are participating in the meeting to have their cameras on. And I know that sometimes we have challenges with scheduling and that sort of thing, but it's important in order to determine whether somebody is actually participating or not to, to make sure that their um, cameras are on. And that's a practice that every board does. Um, and you know, you can discuss it if you have an objection to that approach, but I think that it would be helpful for you moving forward to be able to confirm whether somebody is actually participating or not. I think that's a good expectation, but there probably needs to be exceptions to a rule. Like Stacy's probably on the, on the, I don't know what do you call the sidelines? What do you call a little league field? I don't know. I mean, it might be hard for her today. Although she's not on right now, so. Yeah, I share Sandra's concern and I would just maybe direct Andy to make sure if we can like incorporate some kind of expectation with that in the rules procedure. Yeah, we, we can definitely do something like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Kristen, you wanna go back to sure. where you were gonna go? So for the July 3rd, uh, meeting uh, in an attempt to see if about establishing a quorum. July 3rd is a Monday with the legal 4th of July holiday being that Tuesday the 4th. We already have one indicator, although it is um, an ex officio member uh, that uh, will not be able to be present at that time. Um, you as a board have a couple different options like we've presented you in the past. You can choose to try and keep that if we can obtain a quorum. You can choose to move it to another day that we can find mutually um, available in that month or like the city council does in the summertime, you can choose to take a, a month off as like a summer break. And staff just remind us, because this came up in the planning meeting for our meeting, that staff is not available on July 10th, so that the soonest Monday would be a July 17th, right? That is correct. So my, I would make the case for canceling the July meeting and having our next meeting be in August in light of holiday constraints. But I welcome others' feedback. Is there any downside of that? I second that. I know it's not an official motion, but it becomes one. Of the I know it was, it was a near motion. Yeah. Um, discussion, Ethan. Uh, I was just going to say that I'm I'm in favor of of canceling the meeting as well. Well, it might be unanimous again. See what we can do with less board members. I shouldn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, all right. Does that work, Kristen? Kristen, 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 Kristen. So what I'm hearing is that you are uh, wanting to cancel the July uh, meeting date. We will put notice up on the web page, um, and we will resume back with the August uh, at the usual date. 
as long as just to clarify that would be July, August 7th be the first Correct. Monday of August right yes according, according to our rules any two of us can ask for a meeting at any point in time it's mm -hmm. so that could be disrupted by two outliers mm -hmm. okay and um, that moves us to the next one um summer quorum setting if you have any indication of any um planned vacations or other conflicts that you're aware of for the next maybe now that we're moving past july um if we go september i'm sorry august september and october because of school um if you could email those to us so we can determine and please email them individually um not as a group um, if you could email those to staff so we can determine whether or not we're going to have issues with um, summer quorum setting, that would be greatly appreciated. Is it on the list to discuss coming back to in person or hybrid? I mean, if, uh, just jumping in here, staff can correct me, but I think that between um, Folks like be remote. Uh, we would always have to have some kind of remote option for all the board to attend. So we are back in the space of it have to be hybrid at best. There's no fully in person mode. That's really an option to bring all the board members here. That poses some logistical challenges, it sounds like. Yeah. Does City Council do hybrid? Yes, they, they do. They, their business meetings are hybrid. Their study sessions are remote. Hmm. Okay. I guess I want to get a sense of what people think about at least trying to meet in person. Some of us. Not. I know it won't be all of us because uh, Member Thompson probably isn't going to be here in town. And I'll give personal experience. Just today, I had first in-person meeting in three and a half years of the Institutional Review Board on campus, and it was great. I mean, seeing some of these people that I've only seen on little faces on a screen, meeting them in person is such a world of difference, and it was so positive. Now, I know that's not um, feasible, uh, and it creates challenges, but I think in person, I'm always a, a fan of in person versus hybrid if we can do it. Maybe we could target some specific dates that would be easier for members to make an in person meeting happen. Unfortunately, you missed, you weren't around or on the board yet for the retreat. I think that was a positive thing. But yeah, we could schedule something. Not for August, I guess. No. One of the things that staff would need to do is have those dates tentatively identified, and then we would have to schedule a meeting room that could accommodate us at, at that date and time. Um, so in previous years, we had had, you know, the um, council chambers, which we had reserved would reserve out for an entire year for the beverage licensing authority on the third Wednesday of every month. And we mm -hmm. had that that set out. Um, council chambers is currently undergoing reno renovations. So that is not going to be available to us for several months. So we would need to look at different um, meeting spaces within the city. We do have a couple options, but we do have to work around all the other current boards and or commissions that are currently working in a hybrid or wanting to work in a hybrid and see where it would fit in um, with availability to schedule that. Mm. And it's almost always going to need to be in a city building. For the technology and the recording uh, purposes that we have for um, the hybrid meeting setups, yes. And is, is September going to, does Labor Day, is it Labor Day? Whatever the holiday that is, does that, will that disrupt the schedule at all? 
I don't know what day, what day the... Labor Day is um, Monday the 28th, I believe. Am I right? Really? It's not the first Monday in September? I apologize. It is Monday, September 4th. So that will change. Yeah, that date would need to be reviewed as well. So I guess looking ahead, is there any conflicts with doing it on the 11th? I don't have anything calendared out that far for staff at this time. Uh, that would have to be looked at. Do you want absolutes if we're going to plan ahead to meet in person, or could we just say September, October, or November? Um, licensing Manager Chen Garris? We could probably work with a range of dates, um, but we would like to hear um, probably like a vote or a majority of the board um, that can confirm that you can attend those dates in person. That would be helpful, but we can certainly work with a range. We don't necessarily need just one date to choose from. I would say let's start in October since that maybe is the, mo the next normal meeting, but I recognize that staff constraints and schedules may not be visible right now. Ethan, Robin? I'm I'm I'll, I'm with Brian on that one. Yeah, me too. October onward works better for me. Unanimous again. Wow. So we we just, have, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to clarify. Um, is the intent to have? a fully in-person meeting similar to what we did with the retreat or is that is the intent to have that as a hybrid meeting with people having the option to attend virtually well i think it, we'd probably be encouraged to come in person if you can and with the option of hybrid for those that cannot either because they're not in the state or they just came down with COVID or something, whatever. Got it. Thank you. That's okay, Brian. It was your suggestion. So, okay. And if, and if, you know, you, something comes up and you say, oh, October is not going to work, then we'll look at November. Okay. Hmm. Okay, what else? Um, the only other thing that we have under the section from regulatory licensing is just a reminder that you did get an email and it was included as an exhibit in materials on the uh, web page um, that there was a racial equity training reminder. Yeah. For those of you that have not scheduled, um, it's very valuable um, for the city. And so they would like you, if you have not already taken your um, racial equity training, to please um, follow the instructions in the email, see when they're offering next, and take advantage of them if you can. Because they're going to keep sending emails. Mm -hmm. OK. And then on to agenda item number nine, matters from the chair and members of the board. I have nothing specific with what the fo other folks. Other than, uh, I mean, I already mentioned, uh, the art. if you have not read the article, you should. Well, I'll get that to staff to include in the future packet, but that just came out over the weekend. Um, and then I just shared these two nice review articles. So these are both literature reviews of other articles. This is an article analyzing the data from other scientific articles about the effects of cannabis legalization. Uh, and again, just kind of highlighting that um, there's a wide variation in terms of the quality of these articles and that, that um, different articles, you're pointing in different kinds of directions. And so 
not to say that there are no effects, but that you know measuring these things is very hard and people are finding different kinds of effects. Um, but I just coincidentally found that these two kinds of really nice in the hierarchy of kind of scientific evidence, like systematic reviews are sort of near the top of the kinds of uh, quality of things because you're looking at a, a group of articles together. So I just was excited to see that there were now two separate um, review articles looking at the effects of cannabis legalization and different kinds of outcomes. Thank you. And Robin, you're going to send at least one article to be included next packet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? We're going to shoot for, an, an, unless there's something else that I don't know, I would be glad to let people have an hour ish of their own life. Since we remember, we're all volunteers. Those in the public who are listening, I, I don't know if there is anybody anymore, but you know, we're all volunteers. Well, that's not true. All of us, <laughs> all of us on the board are volunteers. Okay. Um, well, I will uh, motion to adjourn, and I'll also thank Sandra for all of her efforts and contributions over the recent months. Oh yes, for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it has been fun and interesting to serve on this board. Thank you all. I really appreciate all of the work that you do and the fact that you volunteer your time to do this is really great. So thank you. I would echo that. And I was going to test Robert's rules of order and do the motion, but uh, Brian beat me to it. Darn it. <laughs> Robin, Ethan. Second the motion and the sentiments. Thank you, Sandra. Likewise. And welcome, Andy. Are you sure, Andy? I, I don't know if I have much of a say in it, so I'm pretty <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Especially with your boss in the virtual room. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we welcome you. Um, all right. Well, thanks. I heard a, a motion and a second. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, have a good Monday evening. Thanks everyone, thank you, Seth. Kristen and Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody, yeah, for sure. And Christopher. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, sir, happy to be here. Have a good one. <laughs>